So the first hypothetical deals with civility at the beginning of a case. And uh, I'm not going to read it for you. It's there. Those of you on the internet can see it. Uh, but essentially, someone starts a case. And this is an opportunity to really be aggressive because we have 200 paragraphs of uh, all kinds of causes of action. Uh, we, uh, uh, someone says, well, I want to get a 30-day extension. Uh, and uh, uh, the client tells the lawyer, I want to aggressively pursue this. I want to take no quarters, uh, take no prisoners, et cetera, et cetera. So Mark, you're up first. Why is civility a problem at the outside of a case? Well, you know, this is one of my favorite hypotheticals because I think it, it, it resonates with everybody because everybody here has probably been, been in this situation. And um, the, my view is this. Uh, and the civility guidelines, of course, address this directly commanding us or telling us that we don't refuse reasonable requests for extensions of time. Uh, or conditions imposed that, that are unreasonable or unfair. Um, so, um, and, but there are two sides to this problem. The first, of course, is <coughs> a situation probably we faced, you faced, where um, you get in a case, as in this hypothetical, um, it, it's almost the time to respond to the complaint is almost run, and you have to get familiar with it, and you call up for an extension, and the lawyer says, uh, I, gotta, I have to ask my client, well, right there, I have a difference of a view. Those, those decisions are not client decisions. You know, I, I analogize, it, analogize it to a situation where you're a surgeon and you are engaged to do an operation. You can discuss with the patient or the patient's family the objectives of the operation, some of the, the, the considerations about how you're going to do it. But the patient or the patient's family is not in the operating room telling you where to, where to put the scalpel. That's what the doctor does. That's what the surgeon does. And there is a line, and people can argue about where that line is, but there's a line between what is a client decision and what is a lawyer decision. Now, the client should have input, and the lawyer has a responsibility to consider the client's input, but there's an area of independent judgment. Uh, so on, on one level... If, for example, it's a non-injunction situation, uh, it's a situation in which, um, you know, it's a money damage complaint, instance, things that happened several years ago, uh, and the person uh, refuses the extension, uh, in my view, um, it's, it, it's inappropriate and improper. Now, there's a practical aspect to it. You have a client that says, uh, don't, don't give any extension. As we'll probably, you'll hear from other people. Well, the client says much more than I've been wronged. Yeah. I'm a victim. Uh, they stolen my money. They took right. my job. Right. So blah, blah, blah. Right. So our client's not very much interested in, you know, lawyers protecting themselves and adhering to their, you know, many clients are not adhering to these principles. So you explain to the client, as I'm sure you have, that um, this would be a tactical mistake because uh, if, if we don't give the extension, uh, the person they're smart, will go to the judge and explain the circumstance, and they'll get it, and they'll lose credibility, because if, you, if you, you're going to be the first application in a case uh, before a judge that, they, you know, you just got in the case, and they're not letting me have a routine extension, a judge is going to look, uh, not look favorably on, on the side that's refused the extension. So, uh, but this is, there's another piece, I just want to set the stage, and then we talk about it and get some other views. You know, just as there is uh, an obligation, and which the courts recognize, to give reasonable requests. The requests have to be reasonable. Where it gets tricky, if you're serving a, you serve a complaint and the lawyer on the other side calls you up and says, I'd like an extension, you say, okay, how much time do you want? Well, I'd like four months. You know, I'm going to be on trial next month, and then, you know, my son's getting married over in Europe uh, during the summer. I'm going over there for three weeks. You know, and, I, and uh, so I'd like four months. Now, is that, is that a reasonable request? And puts you in the position, and you can change the facts, two months, three months, five months, 
uh, puts you in the position of, of having to say no because an unreasonable request has been made. An example that comes to my mind from the goes back to the 90s. Had a case where um, we had waited for two years to get to get the discovery in a federal case. It was in Connecticut. All the, the discovery, with the witnesses were in London and, and elsewhere. And we finally got to go forward in discovery after being delayed with motions for two years. Uh, and three months in advance, we, we scheduled depositions for these witnesses for the summer because you have to, you're dealing with non-party witnesses, right? And uh, uh, we scheduled three months in advance, got a master over there, got all the local lawyer involved. You know, and a couple of weeks before, uh, the lawyer on the other side calls up and says, look, um, we'd like to adjourn the depositions. Um, you know, the associate on the case has been pulled off on another case. Well, maybe that's the lawyer's problem. You know, this was made three months in advance. So it's a difficult situation. And so I think there can be two sides to this. Okay. I, I would just yeah. add that um, when you take an unreasonable position about extending a courtesy, um, I think, um, as Mark pointed out, that's not, that doesn't sit well typically with judges. And we have obviously judges on the panel who can comment on that. but. Um, if you have to make a motion to um, extend the time to answer and there isn't any other extenuating circumstances in the case which would mitigate against granting that extension, in my experience, um, judges to discourage this sort of behavior will give a very long period of time in which um, the defendant has to answer or otherwise move. So you really, um, by not extending the courtesy, you're potentially punishing yourself or punishing your own client. So there's really no reason to do it. And I think that, you know, this is just one of those instances where you have to control your client and you have to say, it's not good for you. It's not good for the, your interest in this case. It's, it, the, the judge is going to be angry with you. You're setting the wrong first impression with the court. Um, and I just think there's much to lose from, from so, uh, taking So you, 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 you take that position, all of a sudden your partner comes knocking on your door, who's the originating partner for this multi-million dollar client. Says, how the hell could you give this person an extension of time? How do you handle that? And how do you, two questions, how do you handle that? And how do you advise young lawyers on how well, to handle that? First of all, the decision about whether to grant the extension is going to be made in conjunction with the, the partner whose multi-million dollar case it is. Um, and the pros and cons have to be weighed. And ultimately, <coughs> if, the, if the partner says, look, that's what the client wants, that's what you have to do, I think it's incumbent on the attorney to explain to the partner and to the client that there could be uh, there could be some blowback from that decision. And as long as everybody's prepared for that um, outcome, you have to do what, what the partner says you have to do. The judges, you have nothing better to do with your time than deal with nonsense extension requests. Well, if I can, sure. certainly, uh, as Danielle indicated, they want 30 days, 60, right, 45, because it's just so unreasonable. And if it's a first time on, if it has no bearing upon prejudicing any of the parties? That's my first question. Right. What prejudice is there? They come up with some, a story that really is not appropriate. So their credibility really goes down with me. It's not about being angry, but it really sets the tone about whether or not I can really have faith and trust uh, this attorney. Okay. Hey. The the advice, uh, that's precisely the advice that I give young attorneys all the time, which is you only have one reputation and um, starting off with the, with the court with such a call is not uh, helpful for your reputation with the court at all. And keep in mind that um, in certain practices, matrimonial, commercial, you're going to be seeing that judge over and over and over again in other cases, and you don't want them to remember you for not agreeing to reasonable requests. You know, we want to see uh, all attorneys acting professionally and with courtesy. How? Any ethical issues there? Um, not really. I mean, if it's Unless there's some element of dishonesty, I mean, it's just really, a, a, again, it's a courtesy issue with respect to uh, making these requests. If somebody, makes a mis if somebody makes a misrepresentation to the court about the reason for a request for an adjournment or there's some other dishonesty involved, then there would be ethical issues. But generally speaking, this is yeah. Good. Uh, a, a much more practical kind of litigation 
uh, issue and, and one that um, a judge would, would, would hopefully control. Is there ever a circumstance where this warrants a report to the disciplinary committee? We talked about this before. A, a failure to, to be civil. Well, it depends on the degree. I mean, the, again, the, um, there are these elements that, re that require, um, uh, that in terms of a mandatory report, under 8.3, there are these three elements. Uh, anybody can report anything to the disciplinary committee, including spitting on the sidewalk. That doesn't mean it's going to go right. anywhere. But um, in terms of the requirement of reporting, it, it has to be very serious misconduct that goes to the lawyer's honesty or trustworthiness. There has to be actual knowledge of it rather than belief or, or supposition. And there has to be client consent. Right. Mark. Let me, let me come at this from another angle. Um, we said earlier about the, the standards of civility are not the basis of sanctions, but that doesn't mean you can't cite them.